Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Nancy. I am an alcoholic. And you guys are a wonderful group. I'm all wired for sound here. Are we working, Doug? Okay, good. Power, plugs, lights, everything. Okay. <laughs> all right, We've been having a problem with taping for a while. So. Oh, yeah, this, this was just really, really neat tonight to come up here and uh, share the potluck with you and the fellowship and the raffle and the balloons and it is it's just really great and I want to thank you for asking me to come up here and share. It's just really special and there's some really special people in the room tonight too that has made all this possible and I want to thank Lisa for passing my name on and uh, so that I could come up here. And, uh, yeah, and I look around the room, and AA is such a small fellowship, and wherever we go, it just seems like we're always running into people. We, uh, my husband and I recently moved to Orland, and I went to the New Year's Eve meeting last night in Chico, and I was just amazed how many people I knew in that room last night, just from going to conferences and moving around like we do, always, you know, if we don't stay in, in one place very long. But uh, I've got uh, brought some very special people up here with me tonight, and I'd like to introduce you to them if you haven't already met them. And Rochelle came into my life. She's a member of our group in Lodi, Lodi Solutions Fellowship. And Rochelle had been having a little problem with some non-AA substances and a while back and she had called me and asked me to sponsor her and I told her that I, I just can't work with anybody who's on uh, pills and chemicals. It just Some people can do it. I'm just not one who can. And she called me back a few months later and says, I'm not doing any of that stuff anymore. Will you sponsor me now? <laughs> and, it, and it's been working really well. And Joan up here in the front row is also from Lodi, and when I met Joan, she says, nobody ever calls me. So uh, my husband and I travel quite a bit, and I don't remember where we were. I think it was in Montreal or someplace like that or, or Montana or whatever. Anyway, I called Joan, and I started calling her from all these different places around the country. And, and, and so uh, we got back, and, and you know, she started calling me. And, it, and, you know, it just kind of works that way. And Teresa, when I was sharing with her about some things that, I had been going on with my daughter when she was a teenager and some of the things that she had been experiencing with her daughter. We, you know, we go through these things and we don't know and understand at the time why in the heck we're going through them. And then we can, at some time along the way, turn around, turn that around and share with somebody else and we make that connection. And, and Joe, of course, is, we, we go back about 17 years. Uh, up in Grass Valley, we had both gone out with the same guy, and then we got <laughs> not at the same time, I, and, and then we started comparing notes <laughs> and started talking. She had another sponsor at the time, but somehow that sponsor was out of town, and we just started talking, and I, th- I think it was about a year or so later, she asked me if I would sponsor, and I told her I had been for the last year. <laughs> right, and then through Joe, I met Casey. Uh, up in Grass Valley, and and then Gary, I, I met Gary I, when I worked at the Newcastle Post Office, and I knew his mother, and then met Gary through A and 139 and a half Mill Street in Grass Valley, and that's where I met my husband, my current husband, uh, in that same meeting, and that was 12 years ago, and that that's just been really neat. My my life, you know, my drinking started in Grass Valley when I was 12, and it, it just progressed on from there. And I was I was 14, and I met my future husband. And just I started. I had the booze, and, and I had the guy, and he was somebody who was just out of jail. He was about five years older than me. Had been a high school dropout. 
didn't like to work, had a terrible reputation, and I thought he was just wonderful. <laughs> and I remember my mom saying when he, she met him, Nancy, he's a man. I was 14. He was 19. Uh, and I learned to do all the things with him that I, I had heard other people talk about doing. And, and, I, and I thought nobody else would want to have anything to do with me. And I married him when I was 17, thinking that, you know, that my life was over. I might as well just throw it all in because it's all over and the, this is the way it's going to be and might as well make the best of it. And, and you know, uh, the only thing we had in common was drinking and sex and didn't know how to talk, didn't, you know, we didn't have anything in common. Uh, I don't think we even liked each other. And, but I was married to him for 16 years, and the only time I could really tolerate it was when I was drinking. And just so much of me felt like a misfit, and never belonging, never fitting in, never uh, just knowing just where to be. Now, we're living up there in Orland now, and that's uh, close to Butte County, and I... Um, remember when I was just, oh, I wasn't even in school yet, and I remember at Christmas time, I in living in Butte City, and we lived, uh, my family was really poor, we lived in this makeshift garage, and looking in at the screen door at these kids, and they had swing sets, and toys, and Christmas tree, and all these things in their room, in their living room, and I remember looking in through that window, and that's the way I felt for so many years, that I was on the outside looking in at somebody and something. Somebody had something that I didn't have, and I never, never quite being there. And I had that same feeling all the way up until I got into Alcoholics Anonymous, never belonging, never fitting in. Never, never knowing what was what, and when I took that alcohol and when I drank that, it it made that difference for me. I could be that person that I couldn't allow myself to be when I was sober. I would say things, I would do things, and I would behave in ways that uh, a lot of you know how how we behave. And uh, and I and then when I would be sober, I would try to pretend that I was something different and that those things really hadn't happened and that I didn't do that. I was into a lot of denial. I was into lying to myself and and never really being honest about who I was or what I was and, and what was going on with me. I started learning how to lie, cheat, and steal at a really young age, and that continued on until I got sober and even into sobriety for a while because, you know, I didn't just come in here and get struck honest, cash register or self-honesty in either way. And I was married to this man for 16 years, and it became very violent, a lot more drinking, and a lot of heartache, and a lot of pain. And I uh, attempted suicide several times. And I had three children, and the last one I had when I was 31. And I <clears throat> uh, I had her because I, I thought, I I was 30 when she was born. And... Um, I had her because I thought she was going to make a difference. She was going to keep me young, and I thought I was getting old. I was waiting for maturity, and um, I knew if I was 30, you know, it, it, they told me when I was 21 it was going to happen, and it didn't happen, 25, never saw it. 30 is bound to happen. Well, 30 came and went, still hadn't happened, so I thought if I had a, uh, another baby, then that would make everything okay. Well, I uh, had this baby and brought her home from the hospital the, the next day, and I, had, I hadn't I had been drinking while I was pregnant with her, and, and I thought, okay, I've done my thing, I've had my baby, I've done this, now I can drink like I want to be, like I want to drink, and, and I took out all the stops. I poured her saucer full of beer, put a pacifier in it, and gave her beer, and I started my drinking, and and I was falling, remember falling over her bassinet and, and uh, leaving her in her little infant seat on the, on the table with my husband passed out in the chair and me going off to the drugstore to get more of my Jim Beam 
or more of my, well, it wasn't Jim Beam. It was, uh, I went to Thrifty Drug to get my, my bourbon that I poured into my Jim Beam bottle so it would look classy. And, and, and I left, left my baby on the table there and, you know, not even concerned about her welfare at all. And the fighting got worse and the drinking got worse, the insanity got worse, the police were calling. Sometimes I was throwing his clothes out. Sometimes he was throwing my clothes out. The school was calling. The neighbors were complaining. The police were there on a regular basis. And it was just becoming insanity. I was going to the emergency rooms with my face bashed in uh, and and drunk and talking about him and how bad he was, never being able to take a look at myself. I uh, went to mental health and sat there and talked about him and what was going on with him. When they would start talking about me, well, I would just shut down and, and just just not want to participate, not want to, not wanting to look at me at all. Just couldn't handle that. And things progressively got worse, and my drinking got worse, and and I wasn't drinking every day. It's just that when I did drink, it. Uh, I was just totally out of control. And the time, the days that I wasn't drinking, I was absolutely insane. And I was taking out all of my pent up emotions, my anger, my frustrations, everything that I had, I was taking out of my children physically and emotionally. And I wasn't there for them. I did a lot of damage to those kids. I had these three kids and, you know, they, they were hurting. They, they had a mother physically in the house, but that's all they had. I fed them. I, Clothed them, I kept them clean, and that's that's all they got. They had no emotional nurturing. No, uh, I didn't know how to play with them. I didn't know how to talk to them. I didn't know how to do anything with them. I was just there, and I, I had tried a suicide attempts many many times, and always very dramatic about it, like going to the living room with a bottle of pills. And I didn't even take pills, and um, but I, I don't know, I don't even know where I got them. But I wanted to be sure that he saw them. And, and I, I tried um, sitting in the bathroom with a razor blade, trying to cut my wrist, a, a, a dull blade, of course. And and thinking, you know, something's just really going to happen. I I had seen um, um, a movie, um, oh. Natalie Wood and Robert Wagner, and, and, and it was so dramatic, she had come out of the bathroom showing her wrist, and they were bleeding. And, I mean, it was, and she was beautiful, and, and this is what I thought I was going to look like. You know, it was just really drama, and, and but it, uh, they were tough, and the blade was dull, so it, it just didn't work. I tried putting a baggie over my head, thinking I can just suffocate. But I was having trouble breathing, and I had to take it off. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) All I wanted to do was for him to get better, the kids to shape up, uh, the job get better, the uh, bill collector stop calling, and uh, the neighbors be nice to me. Uh, you guys just want uh, realize who I was, that I was just this nice gal, and if you just understand me, we'd all be okay, and then if everybody would shape up, we'd be fine. But that just didn't happen, and it, and it kept getting worse, and the violence kept getting worse, and... Um, and the drinking kept getting worse, mine and his. And oh God, I I just re- uh, I resented him so much, and uh, all those resentments, uh, the, putting those balloons out there was was wonderful tonight to be able to let go of that. And uh, yeah, with my my husband, I I I I envisioned these wonderful ways of taking care of him, sort of like uh cutting off his penis and sewing it up in his mouth when he was sleeping. And But I was afraid that if he would wake up and he would take off his belt and start hitting me. So I didn't do that. And then I thought, well, maybe if I, I got some spiders, like black widow spiders, but mind you, I was afraid of spiders, but uh, I was going to put these in his sandwich and send them off to work. And, I mean, it would look so innocent. A little spider just happened to crawl into a sandwich. <laughs> and, and, you know... My thinking wasn't really great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think it was one day when he was threatening me with guns. And and I wanted to. I, I, I had just 
got to the point to where I couldn't live that way one more day, just not one more day. I was getting sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I, and I, ooh, and I, I just couldn't keep going on. And I got in my car, and I was driving around looking for a place to kill myself. And, and it just about happened. I was at a real tricky intersection, and I saw this light yellow car just coming at me, and it was right at my door. And I thought, this is it. It's all over. It's all over. And I, and I just knew I was going to die. But I don't know what happened to the car, but I heard a voice tell me that you don't have to go this way anymore. There is a better way. And it was a man's voice, and I like to think of that as my higher power and, and my spiritual awakening. Something just telling me that there was some hope, that there there was maybe something different. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that it might be different from what I had. There might be some reason for my living. I was apologizing for taking up air that other people could be using. I knew that I was not a good wife and not a good mother, not a good employee, not a good friend, not good at anything. And and I just felt so worthless and so uh, unworthy of anything. And and I went home and I had been seeing programs on TV, uh, like from the Council of Alcoholism and uh, and other programs. And I and I called the Council on Alcoholism. I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I had been hearing about it since my father was uh, was a young man. And you know, when we lived in Petaluma, I remember going to the to the movies and seeing Come Back, Little Sheba. And I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, but I, I knew that that was for drunks and not people like me. So I called this uh, respectable council on alcoholism, and they asked me um, if I drank, and I told them no. And they asked me if my husband drank, and I told them he, my I well, of course I called and told them that my husband had a problem with alcohol, and they asked me if he used pills, and I says, oh God, no, we couldn't afford anything like that. But I was in denial, you know, about my own drinking. So they sent me to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon was wonderful because in Al-Anon, you can drink. <laughs> Nobody says anything about it unless they start getting suspicious like they did with me. <laughs> so I was in Al-Anon for five months of basic training and there pointing the finger at him and trying to control his drinking, measuring his drinks and trying to figure out it said something about setting up a crisis. How could I set up a crisis for him so that he would do this? Trying to control, trying to manage everybody's life but my own. Couldn't see that my own life was unmanageable. Just I, And it was falling down around me. Houses in foreclosure. You know, just uh, not knowing which end was up. And I, I kept, uh, I'd have to sneak out of the house because he'd try to block me and he'd get me down on the floor and he'd start knocking me around going to these meetings and, and I had just enough courage because I could, you know, I could say all anons can drink and, and I was and, and I got the courage to drink and to read the big book. They told me that if I read the big book it would help me to understand my husband and, uh, I started reading that and my husband didn't read and I had this book in the headboard of the bed, and he never looked in that headboard, but he pulled out that book, and he found it, and he ripped that into about three different pieces. And and I took those pages because I had paid something like four seventy-five or four twenty-five. It's not much more today for that big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had made an investment in that book, so darned if I was going to let him tear it up on me. So I took that book and I scotch taped it page by page in those sections. Uh, and putting that back together. And as I taped it together, I started reading it. And as I started reading it, I started finding me, especially when I got to Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. It was talking about me, and I, and, and I start, something started clicking. You're, you're talking about, I'm supposed to be reading this for him, but this is sounding like me. You know, and I, and I, I'd always just kind of laughed and thought, well, if... Um, if I ever become an alcoholic, I'm just going to get there cheap because it doesn't take much for me to get drunk, which was true. I really have the allergy to alcohol. And I compared my drinking with his drinking. And, you know, it was really neat when I got into Alcoholics Anonymous and I, and I said that, and people told me that it's not how much you drink. And that really doesn't matter. What you drink, where you drink, who you drink with, when you drink, 
uh, why you drink, those things just don't matter. What is important is what does alcohol do to you. If it affects you in any area of your way uh, of your life, mental, physically, spiritually, emotionally, if it is if it affects you any way at all, then it might be a problem. And I and I'm very grateful for the people who told me that. And as I drank about three days a week, the other days I was just just raging nuts. And uh it was it was just a vicious cycle for me. I started talking to some of these women in, uh, in Al-Anon about um, I, w- I could identify with the husbands that they were talking about in Al-Anon instead of the ones who were the Al-Anon. And they suggested that I start uh, talking <coughs> to some of the women in Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the, the women came to pick me up for a meeting one night, and her husband was with her. And, I, you know, it's, it's God, God puts people in our lives. When we're uh, when they're supposed to be there, and uh, I had talked to this gal, and she had talked to her husband, and and he started talking to me about my drinking, and he, and he asked me uh, about my drinking, and, and I and I told him my husband made me do it. You know, just uh, you know, it took me back to when I was a little girl and I got caught with a little boy under a tree, and his his mother caught us and stood me up on on the hillside, and uh, and asked me why did I do it, and I said he made me do it, and it took me right back to that five year old child, and I remember my mother slapping my face and calling me a whore, and and knowing at that time that I was just absolutely worthless and there I was that little five year old girl standing there at 31 years of age uh, telling this guy that he made me do it and he just says bullshit you, you, just, you just drank because you, you drank because you wanted to you drank because you're an alcoholic and I thought oh I read some place in here that we can't label anybody else an alcoholic and uh, he, he just says Let's go to a meeting. <laughs> he suggested that I go to a meeting of, uh, there was, uh, Alan on one side and AA on the other side. Go to Alan on for the first half and then go to AA on the second half and see where you feel most comfortable. Well, I, obviously I made the right decision that night. And I, I crossed over and found where I belonged. And, and I, I was still wasn't quite sure whether I was really an alcoholic or not, I started listening to some of the stories of the people who had been in prison, the ones who had had the DUIs and and been picked up and lost their children. (coughs) And a lot of those things hadn't happened to me yet, or at least I thought they hadn't. I I hadn't been looking at the fact that I'd been in those uh, emergency rooms with my face bashed in that I'd had the, the cops stop me. They didn't pick me up, but they didn't stop me. And uh, they they didn't take me in. And there, the, um, the insanity of, of what was going on, the stealing, the, uh, the lying, the deceitfulness, and, and everything that was going on with me and my attempted trying to kill my uh, my husband and the child abuse and, and and I was still the denial in me was just trying to put myself a little cut above not quite as bad and they told me to come in and listen for the feelings not for the stories don't listen for the horror stories sure I hadn't been out there on the street selling myself but when I was 15 I let that uh, same guy stay with me because he was paying paying my rent and I didn't have a job same difference. It didn't make any difference whether I was out there down on um, Wilson Way in Stockton or not. Is I was doing the same thing for money, selling myself. And I had to take a look at that and see where I was and, and my my own deceit and my, my own denial. And it took a long time to break through that and to see that, uh, to recognize the fact that alcohol was definitely playing a part in my life. I could see now that my life was unmanageable. I could take that last half of the first step, but taking that first half of the of the first step was more difficult for me. It took me about four years of really, they told me just keep coming back, don't drink between meetings, put the plug in the jug, 
I'll get down on my knees and talk to this God that I didn't believe in, <coughs> fake it till I make it, get a sponsor, get active, go to meetings, um, just <coughs> don't say no to an AA request, get involved, work the steps to the best of my ability. And and I, I just did the motions for those first few years. And I I knew that this was the only chance I had. Yeah, I, I saw people coming in and out, in and out, in and out. And I got sober in San Fernando Valley. And the Alanest was one of the first places I ever went. Some of you may be familiar with it. And when you walk in there, they say, welcome to the bottom. <laughs> that was it. We had these old rickety chairs. I mean, it, it was pretty bad. And um, sponsors who didn't want their babies going to the Alanest would say, Oh, they would actually want their babies to go to the LNS because that's where they knew that the good sobriety was. But they'd say, I don't want you going to that meeting. Just stay away from that meeting. So what <coughs> they felt like if they told you not to do something, you're going to do it. So that's the way they get you to go to meetings. <coughs> so I went there, and, and I, I, I'd learned to listen. And and I just I knew that this was my only chance that I had. I just I just know that, and I know that in my to my innermost self today that I don't have another chance out there. I don't have that other recovery. I can't be that revolving door. I see people doing it over and over and over again. I just don't believe that would ever happen for me. <coughs> I had so much pride and ego going for me. I don't think that I could do that. And so I kept coming back, and I got involved, and <coughs> they told me to stay away from the men. The women work with women, and men work with men. And, and when I came in here, I didn't feel like anybody would want to have anything to do with me anyway. As <coughs> I, I knew that I wasn't attractive, and that uh, I wasn't smart, and I... I had no sense of humor, and I didn't know how to carry on a conversation other than the fact that my name is Nancy. Uh, what's your name? How long are you sober? <laughs> and that was the extent of my conversation. And, and that's all I knew how to do. Uh, and then they told me, some of the women, because I was 31, and uh, some of the gals that had been around there said, you got to be a piece of dog meat for some guy in Alcoholics Anonymous not to want to hit on you. So, <laughs> and, 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 uh, <laughs> and especially at the Alanist. <coughs> and, and so I started getting this attention from the men. And, and I, I, wow, this was neat. <coughs> I really um, was having fun with that. Oh, thank you. An Altoid. <laughs> All right. Fall over in your oak. Okay. Whatever works. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I started looking for other things in Alcoholics Anonymous other than the program. And it was about, after about six months of uh, thinking that this was kind of a social club because this was something different from anything that I'd ever had before, um, I, I was finding myself getting into a lot of trouble. I was staying out of the relationships. But I was just kind of playing around and flirting around with it and just having fun with it. And, and then I noticed that there was something really missing in my program. And I looked around and I saw people talking about God and about a higher power that I conveniently put up here on a shelf someplace. And, and I knew what was missing in my life was that I didn't have that conscious contact with power greater myself. And I, I set out on my journey to find it because I, I I wanted everything that you had in here. It looked really good, but I just felt like I was really missing it, what, whatever it was. And and if I was going to hang around this place, I wanted to go for the whole thing. You know, they told us half measures and failed us nothing, and I had to be willing to go to any length for sobriety. And I went on my journey searching for a power greater than myself. Um, and, I, and I'd ask people, how do you find it? Where do you go? What do you, what do you do? And they told me to act as if, to fake it till you make it, to get down on my knees and talk to this God that I don't understand and ask him to help me and thank him for keeping me sober for that one day and helping me to stay sober for another day. And to um, 
to just keep talking to people. If I if I didn't have a power greater than myself, some of the group, some of the members of the group said that I could borrow theirs until I could find one of, of my own. And, and people were loving and they're kind and they they put up with me. Um, I went down to the beach at Santa Monica and stood there by the pier one night. I'd been using my palm tree in the front yard, but it really wasn't doing much for me. So I went down to the beach and I started looking at those waves with the the moon, the silvery moon just shimmering down on the waves and, and the foamy caps just coming in, rolling in one after the other after other. And then I remembered reading in the big book about the power, about plugging in the electric cord in the wall and the power is right there. <coughs> and I could relate that to the waves coming in. <coughs> Um, and and I realized that there was a power greater than myself. And there was something out there keeping me sober and keeping the rest of you sober. And if it could work for you, maybe it could work for me. And I started just plugging into that power and, and using it. And I, I thought at that time that if there was a God, he wouldn't want to have anything to do with somebody like me. He was more for people like you who deserved him. But I, I found that by just reaching out, and when I reach out, and I'm willing, I supply the willingness. God supplies the power. He's always there when I ask, and I take him with me wherever I go, and I talk to him, and I thank him. It's just like a, just like a friend. And... and he is my best friend. And and I found that that carried me through so many situations. Now, I, I didn't just come into the program and get sober and turn wonderful. It just didn't happen that way for me. I still had a lot of issues going on. I had a lot of child custody going on. My sobriety date is <clears throat> May 24, 1972. That was the day that I filed for a divorce. And I didn't have to drink after that date. And that was the first thing that I had ever done that was really positive for myself, but it took me four years going back and forth to court battle, not being able to let go, still hanging on, uh, trying to show that I was the better parent and, and, you know, that he was no good and dragging these kids back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I remarried when I was two years sober to a, a guy who had a nice job been on the job for about 30 years or something and <clears throat> seemed to be financially secure. He had nice manners and he talked nice to me. He treated me nicely. <clears throat> and and he asked me to marry him. Now, I had no idea what love was, but he sure looked good and looked better than anything I'd had, so I married him. And <clears throat> my I, and I had given up custody of these children and... Uh, in the back of my mind, I, I, I kept thinking, my God, what is wrong with me? Uh, what kind of a parent am I that I can't keep my own children? What is wrong with me? You know, I see other people with their families, and they're just doing fine. People would talk about, my daughter is an honor, I see these bumper stickers, my daughter is an honor student at this school, and I think, gee, you know, my, my son is an honor student at Patton State Hospital or something, I, I, you know, just, uh, you know, I, I'd want to go rip off their bumper stickers because that wasn't the way it was with my kids. Um, and it was just, uh, it was still chaos for a long time. And I was going to a counselor and didn't know how to stop all this fighting and dragging back and forth in the courts and the whole thing. Um, he was getting tired of listening to me. And he finally just told me, well, why don't you just call him up and tell him that... Um, you and your husband would like him to take the kids for a weekend so you could get away and enjoy yourself. <clears throat> and when I did that, uh, my uh, the kid's father just never came around anymore. He stopped fighting. I stopped fighting. We stopped fighting everything and everybody. We have to or it kills us. And, and I, I didn't know what to do with those kids. Those kids came back to me. I didn't know how to be a parent to them. I, you know, I hadn't been when I was drinking, and I sure didn't know how to be when I, when I was sober, and I was trying to take all these classes and do all this stuff, and a big part of me wanted to run away. I could run away in Alcoholics Anonymous. I could get lost in H&I. I could get lost in sponsoring, going to a lot of meetings, going, 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 just immersing myself in this program, but not working my program at home. 
and that's what I did for about five years. And I, I left the responsibility of the kids on that second husband, <clears throat> left them with him, and I, and I continued just to do what I had to do for me. And they told me that it was a selfish program, and I, boy, I took that one to heart. And, and, and I found myself starting to chippy away at, uh, at different things. I, um, I, I took some, uh, I did a lot of photocopying at work. I worked for the federal government, and I did a lot of photocopying for our meetings on our photocopy machine. I mean, that's the only from the federal government. And, and I took some sheet protectors. I thought these looked nice in our format in the meeting. And, um, wrote, wrote a bad check to central office. You know. And so, you know, uh, I was looking back into a lot of the things that I had been doing when I was drinking. And I heard a speaker once say that he, he was doing these things and his sponsor told him that each time he did these, he was chipping away at his sobriety. And little things started clicking, and and I didn't like who I was becoming, <clears throat> and I and I started doing these little uh, lying things, stealing, uh, chipping away, uh, just being dishonest with myself and with others. Up to that time, I tried taking four steps, and I could never really take a really fearless and searching, thorough four step. I just couldn't. It was like Pandora's box there, just with a big steel lid on it, and I. Uh, I just couldn't open that lid, and and a lot of things were going really bad in, in my marriage, and and just I, I was going to bed, I was just crying at night. I was lonely and um, just un, unhappy, and the kids were in, still in chaos. And I was sober 12 years, and I had been busy sponsoring a lot of gals and being active in the meetings, and and still a lot of stuff going on. And my daughter came to me <clears throat> one day and, and told me that uh, my my son had been uh, molesting her. And, and I thought, oh, my God, you know, here I thought we were going to be the perfect AA family. He was going to be in Al-Anon. The kids are going to be in al and al tot and al cat and Al-A-Pup and me and AA. And, <clears throat> and we were going to be the perfect family. And now this was happening. And what was I going to do? And I had to take action on it. And I had to see my son locked up in the psychiatric hospital when he was 15. And it was just really painful. And I thought, the sickness, the sickness in this family, what, what is happening? This is supposed to be Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm trying to do all these things. Why are these things happening? But I did the full work of what I had to do. And a lot of help at that time was given to my son, but none was given to my daughter. All the focus was on my son. And two years later... Uh, my daughter came to me again, and uh, and she told me uh, that uh, her stepdad was doing these things to her. And here it was all over again. And I thought, oh, God, you know, just what what is going on here? My, I'm trying to stay sober, and this is just going. And uh, and, and I was afraid, what will people think of me? And uh, you know, just pride and ego, a lot of stuff going on. The only thing I was doing right was not taking a drink. And I was going to meetings. And at that time, I, my sponsor had told me that I needed to stay home and uh, spend more time with family. I'd cut my meetings down to two meetings a week. I don't recommend that, not not for somebody like me. And that's when a lot of these things happened. The, lot, the farther I got away from Alcoholics Anonymous, the farther I got away from the principles of the program, the farther I got away from the teachings that you taught me what to do here in this program. And, and that marriage broke up, and I uh, I left my that uh, husband in in Southern California, and I brought my daughter back up to Grass Valley, and that's where I'd been raised, that's where I'd gone to school, and that's where I'd known the most happiness, and I wanted to go back up there and and start over with her. And I took my daughter, who was 12 years old at the time, and and I just turned myself in. She well, actually, she's got 11 months more than me. She was 11 months old when I got sober. And uh, so the two of us came back up here, and I just turned myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I just wanted to raise my hand as a newcomer. I just didn't drink, but I was just like a newcomer. And I had to set my ego aside, my pride, anything that I had done before, and just say, I am new. I need your help. I'm here. You know, just 
be there for me, give you your phone numbers. I don't care how long you're sober. And up to that time, if you had less time than me, I didn't want to have anything to do with you. I'd tell you how to work the program, but you weren't going to share anything with me. I wasn't going to listen to you. And now it, it just didn't matter. I didn't care if you had 30 days or what. If you had something you wanted to share with me, I was going to listen. I had to become willing. I had to become open. I had to become teachable. And I, and I, and I had to get, get humble and get down and hurt to be able to really fully accept this program. And, and when I did that, it was the most miraculous thing for me. I was starting my program over the way and to be able to build the kind of program that I really wanted to have and know that I could have if I worked for it. And, and it wasn't easy. And, and I got people like Joe who came into my life and who were there and to walk me through a lot of things. I, I, I was lonely, and I had asked God to send me this man well, first I got the one that she had, and <laughs> and, I, and that lasted for about a month. I thought, I don't want that, and um, and and, and then I I got the lonelies again, and I asked God to send me this uh, somebody who would just love me. Money wasn't important; just somebody who would like to just be with me, and maybe go to movies. Well, that's exactly what I got. I got a guy who um, worked with and who who he was, and he loved to go to movies, and just uh, and he loved me. He wanted to marry me. Of course, I had a house that I had built, and you know I was supporting him, and he was being there. And of course, he looked it looked good, and he didn't have to do anything. And and people like Joe and some of my other gals were were telling me, Nancy, take a look at this. You know, this isn't right. He's not really nice to you. <laughs> He's using you, and I couldn't see it. And I had to, I was going to another group and didn't know what to do with this. And, and somebody told me, why don't you just ask him to leave? And it hadn't occurred to me that it would be that simple to do that, to get myself out of this situation. And I asked this guy, I went back home and, and, I, and I, well, I didn't really ask him. I sat on the side of the bed because that's where he was. And I, and I just, I was stumbling over the words and he says, you want me to leave, don't you? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And when I got out of that relationship, you know, it was just lots of things just happened for me. I was able to finally do that fourth step that I hadn't been able to do. And, and it was just, I, I was working with the gals in the program and loving it and just really enjoying myself. And uh, God put some such beautiful women in my life for me. I am so grateful for that, to help me to learn to be a woman that I didn't feel like I could be. And, and the people that he put in there for me to, to walk me through this. And, um, and I wanted to just stay with the gals in the program, just work and do what I was doing. And uh, I couldn't believe it when God put this other guy in my life. And I thought, God, do you know what you're doing? And, uh, and I guess he did. I guess he did. You know, when we just turn things over and, and let God do what he's going to do, miracles happen and things happen. God put a, a guy in my life that uh, I started uh, the relationship off differently. In the past, it had been, um, hi, how are you? Go Hop in the sack, and, and then, then where do you go from there? Well, I wanted to do things differently with this one, and I, and I felt felt better about it, and I felt it was God-inspired, and, and it was, it was, and we just started out by being friends as, instead of just starting out on a sexual basis, because up to that point, that's all I thought I had to give was sex. You know, I just didn't know there was really anything inside that anybody would really want me for me, not just my body, and, uh, and we started being friends, and, and it just evolved, and, and, and it, it was beautiful, it, it just was was <clears throat> I, if I had planned it, it never would have happened. I wasn't looking for it, but it happened. And we went together for about a year and a half, and we got married. Uh, I was living in Grass Valley. He was living in Elk Grove, and he got a job transfer up to Red Bluff. And he found he was driving around town and saw this little church in the mirror, rearview mirror of his car. And he thought this would be a really nice place to get married. And he, he actually got down on his knee in a restaurant <clears throat> and asked me to marry him. And he was down on his knee, and I was so shocked. And I just laughed. And, and he was down on his knee, and he kept looking up at me. He said, well, will you? Will you? 
Uh, uh, you know, it, it's just neat. Yeah, um, and I had we had AAs there at our wedding, and and people came up and helped you know helped us put this together. It wasn't expensive. We made a lot of the decorations and did potluck, and but it, but it was great. And AAs were there, and we continued our journey. And and through that, we uh, we my husband and I. My husband has 31 years of sobriety, and he's just a wonderful man. He's working tonight. We just. As I mentioned, we just recently moved <clears throat> up to Orland, and he's working at a conservation camp up there where he's the camp commander. He works for the Department of Corrections, and he had <clears throat> that's where he was working when we got married. And we had uh, lived up in Red Bluff, and we moved back down to Galt, and then we, we transferred and promoted. We moved over to Fort Bragg for three years, then moved back to Galt. Uh, and now back up here to Orland, when we get done there, we'll move back to golf again. <laughs> and, um, but God puts us exactly where we're supposed to be. And God, uh, being up there around Chico and Orland and Willows, and God, uh, God sent me a newcomer the other day, and she was just so neat. And, and uh, it just felt good to, to say, can I give you a ride to a meeting? And, and to do that, because we can't keep this thing if we don't give it away. And the more that I give, the more I, I get back, and, and the better it feels. And I, you know, being able to apply these steps in my life, just one step at a time, and it works, and it gets better. And taking those inventories and doing that digging <laughs> and doing that work, that yeah, it's much easier to go off and play or do something else, but I find for me the, the action in the program is in the steps. And when I get into those steps, things happen. I've been, been going to the Big Book Seminar for several years now, <clears throat> and been, I'd never had anybody take me through the steps. They told me, uh, we were talking about that on the way up here, they told me, here's the Big Book, read it, and uh, we'll talk about it. And But it really wasn't much talk about it, it just read the book, and that was it. And then going to the Big Book Seminar, and I'd hear Willie B. every year going through the 12 and 12 and going through those steps, and Joe and Charlie going through the Big Book. And last year, I thought, you know, I think it's time that I, I, I asked somebody to really help me to start going through these. So I asked Willie B. to, to if she would sponsor me. And she says, well, you know, huh, huh, I'm in Texas. You know, how's this going to be for you? And I said, I have no problem <clears throat> with long-distance sponsoring. Uh, it works well for me. I, I sponsor a lot of my gals long-distance Joe, we followed each other around the stage. She was down there in Chula Vista. We, we'd write, we'd uh, use the Internet, we'd do whatever we could. We'd use the phone, whatever, but we keep in touch. And and so I, I, I used Willie and uh, using her tapes and been going through the tapes with the gals and uh, <clears throat> going through the steps and, and working those. And when I get to share that with the, with the other gals in the program, it makes me feel, it makes me know who I am more as a woman and as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and to sh- that sharing, I can't do this program by myself. It just doesn't work. This is a we program. Got to put it all together, and it does work. And if you're out there and you're new and you're feeling like you're all alone and nobody understands what's going on inside and you're the only one who feels this way, and if anybody ever really knew what it was like, oh, God, you know, that was my swan song, you know, you wouldn't want to have anything to do with me. Well, I found out in here, the worse you are, the better accepted you are. And, <laughs> and then we get into the can you talk this type of thing. And, yeah, and then I, you know, at first I came in here and I thought I was really too good for this, and then I, I got to where I, I wasn't bad enough, and I, and I wanted to make my story worse, and now I find out that all I have to be is just me. And and people tell me, we accept you warts and all, and, and they love me, and they listen to me, and they share, and, and I am so grateful for the women who call and, and share with me, and we share one and one, and it's not a dictator type of thing, it's just sharing what's been happening with me. I can't share anything uh, with you that I haven't been through myself. And and if it works for me, chances are it will work for you because it worked for you and you shared it with me and I have to trust if it worked for you, it will work for me too. This program does work. It really does work for those who really want to put the effort into it. If I do the action, the feelings will follow. But I've got to do the action first. It doesn't just happen. But this program is here. And they, uh, we've got some newcomers, and welcome to our newcomer here, which is, uh, how many days was it? 
seven days. Fantastic. And you're here in a meeting. <laughs> and you, you made it through your first sober New Year's without having to drink. That's pretty darn good. And, you know, if you, if you ever feel like you're at the end of the rope and you just, just no place to go, just, you know, reach up there and tie a, a knot in the end of that rope and just hang on for that for all you've got because it's here for you. It's here for you. Just reach out and grab hold and just say, I need help. And whenever somebody reaches out anywhere, any place, any time, I am responsible that the hand of AA always be there. And when I reach out, your hand is there to take my hand. And the same as mine is for you. And I thank you very much for letting me be here to share with you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.